I am the mother of little Zoya. Zoya was born in 2004 as a totally healthy little girl. She was very happy. Uh, she was the center of our world, and she still is in some kind of way. Uh, until three of, un, until her uh, three, uh, until three, she was totally uh, healthy little girl. Uh, she start talk, talking on time. She start walking on time. Uh, she went in the kindergarten and preschool. So we had a normal life. Uh, I remember that uh, I always put her ponytail on the top of her head because that was the only way to know where she is or where, where she want to be. She was very fast. She was faster than <laughs> all of us. But uh, one winter, uh, when she had uh, three years and four months, uh, she, get, she went, uh, she went uh, on the, to play on snow with her grandmother, and she got her first epileptic seizure. Uh, of course, it was a big shock for all of us, because before that, I saw epilepsy. I, I just heard for epilepsy on some films or books. Uh, uh, but, okay, doctors told us it is not so, uh, it is not so scary, don't be scary, she will be fine, you can live with epilepsy, this is 21st century, and blah, 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 yeah. But uh, we, we, we tried to, she, she started with her therapy, and we, we tried to carry on with our lives. Uh, uh, her condition, however, gradually get uh, worse, and uh, all time doctors still talked to us, uh, told us to not to be scared. She will be okay. Uh, don't be a panic mom. That was my favorite, really. Uh, uh, Zoya started suddenly one day stop walking, stop talking. Uh, she couldn't even hold her head like this, she just was like this. Uh, and the, 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 the thought how she must be scared in the moment when she lost her sight also terrifies me. Uh, because she just, uh, suddenly uh, she just ca could hear me, but she couldn't see my eyes uh, to see that everything will be okay, because it won't. Uh, then doctors suddenly changed their story, and my favorite also, okay, during the years she will be get worse and worse and worse, and then during the years we will, we will understand what is it with her. Come on, is that best you can do? You are a doctor, for God's sake. You, you, you must be better than this sadness. Uh, but they said that they have no idea what's wrong with her. Uh, lady, go, go home and wait her to die. That was their advice. Uh, eventually, we find one doctor that, uh, who, who, who told us very uh, open that uh, there is no way to diagnose her at Serbia, that we must go abroad. And uh, like every normal citizen of normal country, uh, we, we went in uh, some go government uh, insurance company to ask them to fund that. Uh, we, we find one clinic in London and we want to go there, but they, there we hit a brick wall. They said us, uh, the sentence, uh, we cannot invest in your daughter because she will die soon. So, that lawyer knew better than doctors in Serbia that she will die soon. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and they said us that Zoya is a collateral damage of our country. Uh, then we have some physical, my husband show him physically what is collateral damage, but that is not the uh, point. <laughs> uh, we went, uh, uh, we, di we, di we did not uh, waste uh, 
any time we go by our we, we pay our trip to London and everything but that is a big problem because uh, when you when you go uh, in some international uh, center uh, without your country backing you they ask a lot of money <laughs> so in two days we sold everything we got we took loan also and we went to London uh, there the experts uh, said immediately that, uh, that uh, she has a button disease uh, and can you imagine that then agony starts <laughs> uh, because uh, we back in Serbia but nobody of doctors uh, knew anything about our disease. Uh, so uh, that disease doesn't have a famous code in that insurance company. But I said to them, OK, doesn't have a code, but we have a name. Isn't that a <laughs> little bit uh, <laughs> more important than code? But no. When you don't have a code, you don't exist. You don't have rights for diapers, you don't have rights for medical, you don't have rights for wheelchair, so you're not there <laughs> at all. And you don't have a problem. Uh, uh, for example, one mother in our organization, uh, he, she also has a sick daughter uh, without diagnosis, and she gets pregnant in the meantime, and the doctor said her, uh, stop the pregnancy, just in case, because we don't, ho we don't know what is with the first kid. Uh, so they, they didn't even bother to check if, it, if the girl has a genetic disease. Maybe it is not genetic at all. But I will be back on the prenatal screening. Uh, so August of 6, 2013, Zoya passed. Uh, she went very peacefully in her sleep with her smile on her face. And things never be the same. And they shouldn't be the same. We couldn't allow any family to leave this, to see this. So devastated by our loss, but guided by our mission to give sick kids right to fight, uh, we start campaign for Zoya law. And in that time, I thought it shouldn't be big problem, you know, the law will help sick kids. Every, everybody will be for it. But the truth is very different. Our first task was to find some uh, politics in parliament uh, that uh, he should be a doctor also, but uh, on the first, sh sh uh, he, uh, he must be a person, human being, you know. And uh, uh, it is impossible mission for our parliament, but we did it. <laughs> we find one guy, he is Dusan Mirosavljevic, and he was, she, she just said, it will be my honor. That was enough for us. The second task was to find person uh, uh, experts in law, medical law, who will help us to put all together. Because I'm not a lawyer, I'm just a mother. He is not a lawyer, he is politics and doctor. So we did uh, find Hairia to help us. And she did not uh, hesitate uh, at all also. Uh, I must admit one thing, uh, that uh, probably we didn't know uh, the size and respons responsibility of this achievement at the beginning, because maybe that is a good thing, because uh, it, it will probably scare us. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, uh, we did have some uh, interesting conversation with our doctors. Uh, in the beginning, doctors uh, were against Zoya's law, with sentence and explanation, uh, 
who can order me to give diagnose. Okay, that is all. That is uh, other team <laughs> for other Congress probably. Uh, but they had no chance. Zoya was on, on our side. And uh, believe it or not, 23rd January was the day that uh, our government uh, adopted Zoya's law. Zoya's law, essence of Zoya's law is three things. First, if doctors in Serbia uh, don't, uh, uh, don't have diagnosed in six months, they are required, they are obligated to send samples ab above, so uh, in ab abroad. Uh, uh, doctors hate that word required or obligated. <laughs> that was so interesting. But the second thing was a prenatal diagnosis. So uh, family with sick kids uh, can have prenatal uh, diagnosed for uh, uh, on the uh, government expensive. So, so health insurance pays that. And third is uh, to test uh, family members uh, uh, as a possible carrier uh, of, of that uh, pathological genes. So, Zoya, thank you. It is honor to be your mother. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I just reflect back on, on what Carly you said earlier on about the silence and sometimes that you're silent for too long and something then s s really snaps and makes you say enough enough and clearly you have been persistent and you've done it with um, it's been a painful experience but very very important and and Zoya really yeah. has been with you Along, along the way, and, co and really congratulations because it's, it's, it's phenomenal what, what you have done. Um, you really have had a strong voice in this. It, it's interesting hearing from your perspective now, because this was a multi-stakeholder approach that was being driven by the patient perspective, but that it couldn't have been a success without having a lot of different stakeholders in. Do you want to comment on your experience of, of of this. Uh, yes, of course. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, first of all, hello to uh, all, of, all of you. And uh, I will try to, to explain from my angle of perception yes. this, this uh, case. And uh, when, when Boyana came to me, um, uh, I saw the problem uh, uh, practically two-sided. Uh, on the healthcare policy and on the legal policy side, and in some sense in their uh, inconsistency. And um, with respect to my professional background, my understanding uh, of the policy was uh, that uh, it has been inadequate, uh, uh, he uh, has been also deficient, and in some uh, issues discriminatory um, against the patients. And this is the short analysis of all situation for, from professional point of view. Uh, and uh, I uh, fi found that uh, some rights were infeasible in practice, which consequently influenced the, the prenatal screening policy also. And that was the short diagnosis of, of this policy situation. And uh, concerning the complaints from Boyana and other patients, uh, I realized that, uh, according to my opinion, were, uh, they, their complaints were expected, reasonable, and well-established. Uh, their motivation was not only to help themselves, but also to express the awareness of a need for policy changes. And uh, uh, for me, that was uh, one of the essential points. And uh, that was a sign for me to to go for the, uh, f further and to uh, to fight for some uh, results. Some sort. Um, uh, also, uh, the next step 
uh, was to employ my own expertise in accordance with the necessity to take into account uh, and strongly represent the interests of the patients. And uh, this resulted in a proposition of a new law concerning rare disease and prenatal screening. Uh, the title of this law is uh, uh, Act on Prevention and Diagnostics of Genetic Diseases, Genetically Caused Anomalies and Rare Diseases, and the uh, unofficial title of this law is uh, Zoya Law. Zoya. Yes, yes. Um, uh, this proposition was uh, presented to decision makers. And uh, at the same time, it was a way of, uh, of uh, strongly involving the patients in the decision-making process. Uh, there is no comeback. Come uh, and uh, for me, uh, it was very important that this is the first law in Serbia uh, where the, in, in a title of law, uh, you, you have a rare disease person. Right. And for me, it is, it is also big results uh, and big uh, achievement. Um, concerning uh, the, the patient uh, representative, uh, I, I think that uh, they have a significant contribution of, uh, for successful and good, uh, good uh, argumentation in favor of new law. It was, uh, it was uh, much easier for me to, uh, to represent and to, to make a legal form of all of this because the, the argumentation is, was, uh, it was very clear and understandable for all, all of us. And uh, through the changing the law, uh, uh, as Boyana said, uh, the, the, the women and families with suspected disease uh, got a chance to make their right uh, to prenatal screening real uh, in, in a full sense, not only declaratory, but in a full sense. A future policy will be primarily based on the needs of family and would also include cross-border uh, diagnostic procedure supported by European health institutions and rare disease network. It is also very, very important, and that's why we are here, I think. It's a very nice pulling together of some of the things we've, we've been discussing and, and an incredible case. But what strikes me as really important is what you've said about building the case, that this wasn't just you going emotionally and saying it's wrong, it's wrong, that you, were, you managed to articulate why it was wrong and why it made sense to, to change. So you brought your real life experience to really build that case that, that, that had the results that you, you wanted at the end of the day. It, it, it really epitomizes the, the, the power of the patient, patient, patient voice. Does anybody want to comment on that? On the, particularly the advocates in the audience, have you had similar situations where you've had to really build your case? You need a microphone. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Albert Cunet from the Belgian Health Huntington League. Uh, I would just like to, to underline what uh, one very important thing that has been said is the importance of genetic testing for hereditary, hereditary diseases. When possible, when a gene is identified, it's extremely important to generalize the genetic testing because it gives a possibility to eradicate completely the transmission of the disease. And also it gives the possibility, uh, secondly, to be involved in, to be uh, registered in a registry, which allows you to be involved, to be included in a total care process from beginning to end when uh, there is no cure, at least uh, you will be uh, taken uh, generously and, 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 and gently uh, care of. And the third point, it gives you visibility because we need also visibility. And my last point, when you ask visibility, uh, we need also a better access to the media for all these points, uh, which are genetic testing, etc., in vitro fecundation, etc. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else want to comment? Um, so last year, 
I think you have to turn on the mic. Yeah. Arlo. Um, last year, we organized a first uh, European meeting, uh, just three patients, one from Poland, one, uh, me from Belgium, and one from uh, Norway. And uh, we, are, we are not so many. It's rare disease, but we had like 20 specialists from uh, around Europe and uh, 20 patients. Uh, the conclusion from the, the both patient and professional that it was quite intim, not at all like a scientific meeting, but uh, also the, the contact between patient and professional in another way than consultation. And they also say, because we suspect that there, there is something genetic, but it's not in confirmed, and they say even if it genetic it's quite complex it's not always it's not complete penetration so um, it was also a way that some genetic researcher could meet each other and they say even if we know the name we don't work together uh, until the moment we really meet each other so it was a first start but at the same time they say yeah it was a good draft it uh, but you should go on and you a patient and association that it will take a long time be before uh, doctors and researchers will take themselves the lead. But we are all patient and volunteers, so it's, it's really hard. Again, it's emphasizing the point that sometimes really it's the patients that have to drive and it requires persistence and your volunteers, you have other, it's, it's, it really requires a huge effort on your part but it can pay off, and we've seen today how that pays off. Any other comments? Um, you want to make another comment? Yeah, and, and then I come here. Maybe in the closing comments, we can hear about the role of Eurydice in, in because that's pulling it all really all together. We will have some comments later on from Eurydice that will really, I think, pull together exactly what you're saying. There is a need for more, more support. Uh, not a patient represented, but a pediatrician who has seen a lot of families with the problem of years and years and years going by until the diagnosis is reached. What the point that struck me in the lady's presentation was that thing, uh, the right to have <coughs> uh, certain tests be done within six months or something like mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Um, okay, I don't know, six months, something, sometimes may not be longer. But from the point of view of patients, I see the necessity to develop the patient's right, rights to reach a diagnosis with all possible means within a reasonable <coughs> time. That's what point of view from the doctor's side. Yeah, uh, can I, can I uh, just uh, comment on that? Uh, maybe uh, for Serbia, with Serbian possibility to diagnose and technology, believe me, it is uh, more than enough six months to try everything in Serbia. <laughs> you know, uh, but uh, <laughs> let's be honest, you know. This is limited, uh, limited to yeah. access to diagnostic yeah. um, possibilities. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, but uh, mm, uh, the point of the law is not doctor, uh, to obligate doctor to find diagnose. Of course, of course that, is the, uh, uh, that is the goal. But uh, he must try to, f to find the diagnose, you know. She, uh, doctors uh, are not allowed anymore to set us I don't know, go home, I don't care, I have other patients, you know, that is the goal of this law. Any other comments? Yeah, I just want to say that uh, I think Bojana is one of the examples we need. Uh, she did a great job and I think it also shows that as a patient you have to be a super professional and that all unpaid and voluntarily. And I wonder how people like us uh, should have the time to make a living and find time to sleep. Because yeah. to be honest, I wake up at uh, eight o'clock and I go and I work till 12 in the night. And, the, and not because I have all these nice things to do, but simply because I'm behind the computer dealing with the whole world. Because as soon as Asia goes to sleep, the US wakes up. 
and that's my job to 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 really engage and involve people and and that's exactly what Bianca did. But sometimes I also feel a bit sad that individual patients need to go to mini to presidents, need to talk to governments themselves to change things in society because other people are too busy with I don't know what, but it, it makes sure it it is clear that we need to do it because no one else will do it for us. So thank you, Moyana. Thank you. I think that that's a wonderful way to end this session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. This was really, really special. Thank you.